Okay, great. So uh, welcome to the final class of modern Jewish thinkers of the summer and also my last official class at the Bayit uh, while I am working here, although I hope life is long and I hope we'll all have many more opportunities to learn Torah together. Um, sometimes you never know how things, how, when those opportunities arise. So what I wanted to study today is uh, Rav Hirsch, three of his comments on the Torah. Okay, and I brought them all in Hebrew, which is kind of ironic for two reasons. The first reason, as I began to say, began to say is that we pride ourselves on our texts and our classes being accessible to everybody. And so having something only in Hebrew and not in English might, you know, stop some people from being able to access the text. But I think because we're going to be learning these texts together and really going through slowly, um, it'll give us an opportunity to sit with each of his lines, each of his phrases and really get a sense of what he's uh, talking about. The second uh, part of the irony, as uh, Stephen pointed out, is that um, this wasn't even written in Hebrew. The, his com the Rav Hirsch's commentary on the Torah was written in German. He also, uh, I would say, was one of the, um, you know, the fathers of making Torah accessible to everybody. He was writing in a time of uh, Reformation, of when the uh, reform movement was rapidly growing, assimilation was rapidly growing in Germany, as in 19th century Germany, and he felt that it was important for uh, his commentary, Neo right, his neo-orthodoxy, his commentary, to be accessible to everybody. Part of his project, part of Rav Hirsch's project in general, was to try to express to the people around him that modernity and Judaism are not mutually are not uh, mutually exclusive. That you can, you know, take on some of the values of enlightenment of Germany, and that that doesn't upend our halachic obligations, but in fact can infuse them uh, with with meaning. Um, and so his his life project um, his life projects was about creating a viable Judaism in a modern in a modern society. One of the big kind of things he's known for, and we're not going to focus on it today, although I think it does have some influence over his writings that I'm going to share with you, is that he separated from the main Jewish community. Uh, in, in Germany, uh, the, the Germans kind of had recognized various groups, various religious groups that had representatives in government level that were able to receive some different kinds of government funding. And one of the things that a lot of people said in Germany was, well, all the Jews have to stick together, right? And we see this in America too, right? There's the, the conference of presidents, or is there a Jewish group that is totally represented or something that represents all Jews? Um, and Rav Hirsch felt that he wasn't willing to really countenance uh, the other Jewish movements that weren't halachic, okay? So even though he's both a person who tried to make Judaism accessible to all, he also wasn't really willing to work with the other Jewish groups in an official government, um, kind of an officially recognized capacity. And so that became both um, a, so he created this paradigm of a certain kind of separatism of orthodoxy, which I think we still kind of contend with today, right? H, you know, at HIR, we, um, we try to work with all the Jewish streams and movements, but there often is a lot of pushback on what is that level of integration and what that level of community and how we see one another. Um, on the other hand, he was a real believer in taking this very, what he conceived of as an authentic Judaism and bringing it to, to all peoples. So even though on an official capacity, he was pretty separatist, his outlook was pretty was pretty wide. And so what I have here for, t for you today is I was reading, uh, I like to read Rav Hirsch on the Parsha. Um, the main reason being that he's what I would say is the first um, com modern commentator who's really like explicitly focused on meaning making, okay? And what I mean by that is that Right, if you have you have a lot of uh, commentators on the Torah, especially the medievalists, who are looking at pshat, who are trying to understand what the text means, trying to answer questions in the text, they're giving drash, they're teaching broader ideas, but it's really um, 
interpreting the text. Rav Hirsch it seems to be like the first one who starts to um, take even a more expansive approach in that he's trying to like create a comprehensive worldview of Judaism, which means that when he arrives at various mitzvot, you know, there's 613 mitzvot in the Torah, when he arrives at different things, he begins to explain, this is the mitzvah, this is how it works, this is what it means, all, and it's all laced in this commentary um, in the Torah. And I, as I was learning through, uh, this is two years ago, I was learning through, I think, something in Parshat Shemot, and he had this word in it. He said, he, he used this term of hakama medina Yehudi. In the establishment of the Jewish state. And I was like, whoa, whoa, what is Rav Hirsch doing talking about the establishment of the Jewish state? Here are some of why that's such a big deal, okay? Rav Hirsch died in, I believe, the late 1880s. Um, Herzl didn't write his book, The Jewish State, till the 1890s, or didn't pub- he didn't publish it, okay? Well, did, who, did Rav Hirsch talk about the Jewish state, or did... Did Herzl come up with it? The second reason it's a big deal is Rev Hirsch was vehemently opposed, vehemently opposed to the religious Zionist effort. I mean, they weren't called religious Zionists, but people like Rev Tzvi Hirsch Kalisher, right, who uh, we've talked about or studied, who was, you know, one of the people who was beginning to write and be an activist on Yishuv Haaretz, on resettling the land, on pilgrimage to the land of Israel and collecting tzedakah for the land of Israel, right? This kind of nascent movement in the early, in the mid 19th century of Jews in Europe starting to say, hey, what about the land of Israel? We can actually, conditions are kind of good under the Ottomans right now. We can start going back there. We can start supporting efforts in the land of Israel. And so that's a movement that begins to take hold across Europe and Rav Hirsch was very much against it. He was very much against it. He had a very religious um, belief in, um, in sort of how the redemption works. He didn't feel like it was appropriate for people to be kind of bringing that redemption on their own or be returning to the land of Israel. He um, was very supportive of the Jewish diaspora, of the Jews in Germany and the thriving that they were doing there at that time. And he was really against kind of the religious project that uh, was Zionism. This, to us, it, to me, um, it feels kind of, it's hard to believe almost, right? Um, you know, of course we know that there's like certain groups of Satmer or the Nturei Karta, there's these extremist groups who are opposed to Medinat Yisrael. But for the most part in 2023, even the Haredi parties in the Knesset who like don't really want to support Israel, like they're parties in the Knesset, right? And even the yeshivish Jews who might not recite Hatikva at the end of davening, okay, no one else does that except for our shul, but even, even yeshivish Jews who might not be reciting Hatikva very often, they support Sahal, they support the Medina, they visit, they travel to Israel, they give immense amounts of tzedakah to yeshivas in Israel. So it's hard to imagine that a modern rabbi um, 130 years ago was so against, but the truth is that was the mainstream position, the mainstream position in Europe in the 19th century and even going into the 20th century was that Zionism, that Yishu Haaretz were problematic, difficult movements that um, the religious leadership for the most part was really against. You know, it wasn't what later when you had um, the Mizrahi movement was founded and certain kinds of religious Zionist ideals, that took a long time to take hold. And Rav Hirsch certainly predates those things and was really against it. Okay, so then the question becomes, why is my class called the Proto-Zionism of Rav Samson Rav Farrell Hirsch? Okay, if he was seemingly like an anti-Proto-Zionist, <laughs> um, why do we call it Proto-Zionism? And so what I did was I found, I looked up in the, in his commentary, his discussion of Medina Yehudit, a Jewish state. And because he's really one of the first uh, traditional commentaries to use this language. And he has it a number of times throughout the Torah where he's using it to describe what the Torah sets out 
as what is a Jew, what should a Jewish society in the land of Israel look like, right? The Torah tells us all kinds of mitzvot. There's judges, there's civil laws, right? And a lot of these things apply in the desert to any Jew or apply to any Jewish community. But some of the things are really dependent on the land of Israel. And the parshiot in the Torah really describe what are Jewish responsibilities? What are Jewish obligations in the land of Israel once we arrive there? Okay, and so Rav Hirsch kind of, I think, does like a double play here, which is that he articulates from the Torah's perspective, what is God's vision for the land of Israel? What does it look like when the Jewish people inhabit the land of Israel? But it's hard not to read in that also this very modern language that he seems to take on himself about like what a modern Jewish state could look like. So I, I mean, I think this is really cool. This is um, my own idea. It requires more research and fleshing out, but I thought presenting it to you guys and sharing it with you would be a lot of, would be a lot of fun. And I, I was honestly kind of uh, surprised by some of the things that he wrote. Maybe you'll feel less surprised or you'll have been hearing me talk for so many years that you're like, oh, this is classic Ezra stuff. But I think, um, I thought this was so powerful to see here in uh, Rav Hirsch's, Rav Hirsch's uh, writings. Okay. How's that for an intro? Any questions or reactions just to, to the introduction? Oh, it's about, it, it, in in uh, Rav Hirschel's book, Old Moon Land, he describes what, 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 what Israel would look like. Yeah, but Rav Hirsch predates the, those works. These writings, these writings come before that, Mr. Olson. Right. So once did, we get the Zionist did, did, movement, did, did essentially, know about, especially, did know about Rav Hirsch? Did Hirsch, Hirsch uh, not, was, I don't think Herzl was reading Rav Hirsch. No, but he might have heard of him. But I, I think that um, what the Zionist movement, the world's the Zionist Congress, the Zionist movement that really takes shape in the late nineteenth, early twentieth century, you know, yeah, of course, yeah, begins to it, articulate it, it, the ideals of what a Jewish state could look like and what it represents and what it has to do with Judaism, what it has to do with God, what it doesn't have to do with God <laughs> for some, right? So we get that, but what's very interesting is to see some of this language already bubbling under the surface in Rav Hirsch's text. Yeah, at Svi. Uh, okay, so my understanding is I, I have always heard that he was an anti-Zionist. I, I did hear that. And I, I just to add to that, I, I will say that I, I'm going to submit that real Zionism, the way we understand it really was did not begin with Herzl, but it did begin with Rabbanim like Reb Tzvi, Hirsch Kalisher, and, and even more so Rabbi Yehuda Alkali. And her, the first Zionist Congress was not till 1897. Zionism really begins in 1881 with Chov of Yeah, 100%, 100% I agree. And, and Rabbanim, it started off as a religious, mixed, more religious than not religious, but in yeah. any case, so my understanding about what Rav Hirsch said is that really, according to some anyway, that his problem with it was that it was, it, it's not, he didn't have any problem with settling the land at all, but his problem was the idea, kind of what you said, that it was it was rushing the Mashiach. In other words, he, and, and to tell you the truth, I've heard some real Zionist rabbis even today who say that, and these are like people really in the Zionist movement, we don't, we can't really say for sure that that Israel is racial to Michal Kulatainu. We, mm -hmm. we can't say that. We don't really know that. So yeah. it's kind of like they would they would seem to agree with, with him. So that's kind of what what I've heard, although that I don't know that that's really the truth, but that that's that's thank you. Know, you. What I've heard about what he what he thank, meant. Thank you, Tzvi. I appreciate that gonna... clarification. I totally agree that of course it makes sense that the place you're gonna see Zionist ideas even before it becomes a secular nationalist movement is going to be in the Torah, which is like half the Torah is about settling the land of Israel. So the idea that these ideas were then updated and taken hold by Rabbanim is so reasonable. And I think what's interesting is to think that for Rav Hirsch, what we're going to write here, I think is very theoretical for him. He's not imagining people actually doing it in his lifetime or in the next lifetime, but it, it is a theoretical model for what he is aspiring towards. Yeah, uh, Stephen, did you want to say something? There was also a split within religious German Jews because Hirschian Jewry became the one, the neo-Orthodoxy, but there was a main, the Hildesheimer, mm -hmm. the mainline Orthodox position in Germany, they were more 
they were Zionist, they were more attuned, and the religious kibbutz movement was founded by Germans. Yeah. It's a German movement. Yeah. This all came out of Germany. So even within Germany, the Hersheans in Frankfurt were separate than basically the rest of Germany. Yeah, of great. Germany. Yeah, so Stephen is sharing that, you know, German Jewry itself had a, a lot of Zionism, especially after this time, so in the late 1800s, early 1900s, but it was within the non-Hersheian camps, right? So I guess... Um, the, all of this serves to clarify that what Rav Hirsch is doing here is somewhat of an intellectual exercise, right? He's not, he's not trying to start a political movement. He's not even trying to weigh in on, on the political, nascent political movements that were going on around him. But what he is doing is trying to articulate what are the values, you know, what are the values that would operate in a Jewish state, okay? Which is, kind of what the Zionists do as well, right? If we read Achad Ha'am, if we read Jabotinsky, if we read um, um, any, Herzl, if you read any of the thinkers, they are thinking about like, what does a Jewish state look like? What does it feel like? What are the values? What are the priorities that make, that would help us understand that this is a Jewish state? For some of them, it's a state for Jews. Um, uh, for you know, a place where Jews can find safety. For others, they actually, for Achad Ha'am, he has a whole vision of a cultural Jewish state that has meaning beyond just a safe haven for for Jews. And then you have everything, you know, everything in between and beyond. Um, and so what Rav Hirsch is doing here is, is I like got somewhat of an intellectual theoretical exercise, but I find his language to be so evocative, powerful, uh, resonant, and challenging for us for today. I don't know if I agree with everything he says. Uh, but it's uh, I I feel caught by it, so I, I thought I would share it with you. We could uh, learn it together. Okay, looks like you know a nice wall of Hebrew text. So we're gonna look at the first one all the way on the right. Um, it's Rav Hirsch on Shemot twelve forty eight on Parak Yudbet. So this is a regarding the Sukim of bringing the uh, the uh, Karban Pesach. Okay. And so this is this is what he says regarding bringing the carbon pesach. The chiyagor itcha ger, right? If you have a ger who's living with you, um, they too can take part in the carbon pesach, assuming that they are fully integrated into the Jewish people. So look at what he says. Be'et hazot im hakamat ha'uma ha'yehudit. Okay. So at this time, he's not saying this time today. He's saying at this time. For the Jewish people back in when they're leaving, getting ready to leave Egypt, but the language is so evocative. Hakama ha'uma yudit, the establishment of the Jewish people, the establishment of the Jewish nation. Huchraz she'akamata shel umazu ena leman bnei Avraham bilvad. We announce it's announced that the establishment of this nation, the establishment of the Jewish nation is not only for the children of Abraham. Those that were redeemed from Egypt and their children and grandchildren. Don't think that when the Jewish people is formed as a nation, that it's something internal, insular, just for those people. The events that occurred from the days of Abraham until the leaving of Egypt, ira'u litovat ha'enoshut kula. This, these events that occurred, they occurred for the good of all of humanity. Okay? And so Rav Hirsch starts to articulate here something a little bit more universalist, right? This belief that these things that happened to us Right? If I, if I come in and I tell you guys, ah, oh, like, and, and let me tell you what happened to me yesterday. It's about me. It's about my family. It's about my kids, blah, blah, blah. Right? It's all about me. But it's nothing to do with you. I'm just talking because I have the, I have the, the platform. <laughs> right? But her first is saying, like, no, these historical events, these things that happened that occurred to the Jewish people, they are for the good of all of humanity. The good of all of humanity. Kol Adam. Every 
human being is able to connect to this. Ulikanes lachog hagulim and enter into the celebration of those that are redeemed. Bimidinat Hashem in God's state, right? It's very not Migdina Yehudit, Migdina Hashem. Mashachashuvhu lo hayichus o hakesher lemoledet. God doesn't care about how you were born or your birthright. Ela chayav hapnimiim shel haadam bilvad. All God cares about is a person's inner life, mm-hmm. what they believe, what they do. Ha'anushiyut shelo, their humanity. Right when God looks at, in God's state, right in God's world. God looks at the human being and how are they as a human being? Hanolad, this is so extreme. I mean, it's shocking. Hanolad ki Yehudi, somebody who's born Jew, ma'aved et to'aro im hafach leben nekar, oved elilim hamenukar la'amo. He destroys his identity, his, his Jewishness, if he switches, if he, um, you know, assimilates and becomes a stranger and serves other gods that are uh, that are strange to his nation. Ulehefech, and the opposite is true as well. Hanolad ko'oved elilim, somebody who serves other gods. Zocheh b'shivayon zichuyot, he merits equal rights ka'asher hu mishpachto mitzarfim lebrit Hashem im Yisrael, when, they, when that person converts and joins the Jewish people. So this first paragraph is not about a Medina per se. It's just about identity. And he says that a Jew can lose their Jewish identity and anybody can gain a Jewish identity if they choose to join in with the Jewish people. So I'd say the idea that anybody could join the Jewish people should feel somewhat intuitive to us, obvious to us. We've all met uh, converts. We've all met people who've joined the Jewish people. Um, But here he's kind of says like, if you give it up, you actually can lose that identity, which really flies in the face of a lot of halachic material, uh, which says that, you know, even a Jew that sins or strays is still considered a, still considered a Jew. But here he, he seems to take a very almost extreme approach. But now let's, let's read the next paragraph, and then we'll, then we'll pause. Yitzhira mikach, more than this. Hamedi- I didn't get that. Hamedina a Jewish state, Medina Yehudit. Medina Yehudit, a Jewish state is prepared to establish settlement rights, rights for those who live there. Im kol hazichiyot ha'ezrach hanilvat aleha. Lechol adam af im lo hafach li Yehudi. Every person who lives in a Jewish state has all of the rights of the people, of the Jewish people, even if they don't become Jewish. Even if they don't become Jewish. That Rav Hirsch believes in a Jewish state, in a godly state, everybody who lives there has to enjoy the same rights. B'tanai shenase leger toshav as long as he becomes one who settles there, an alien strange, um, a resident alien, v'kibel al atzmo, and accepts upon himself, et hachovot ha-novaot metafkido kiben enosh. Okay? As long as he accepts upon himself the basic human responsibilities of being a human, not of being a Jew, not of religious behavior, but of being a mensch, if he accepts like the basic responsibilities of mankind, then he has then that person is considered a citizen of a Jewish state or of a godly state, and they receive all of the same rights of everybody who lives in that land. Okay, I this is Rav Hirsch. So he doesn't bring in he doesn't bring in Ben Noach here. Right? One could imagine that, oh, is there a Ben Noach? He doesn't seem to bring that in. He seems to say, if you live in the land and you act as a decent human being, then there are ways you have to be treated as someone who lives in that land. And that's what, that's what God wants. Um, other comments, reactions to this? 
Rabbi Cook. Yes, uh, what's his relationship to Rabbi Cook? Rabbi Cook. In other words, in order, in order to, be, uh, to be a good Jew, you have to live in Israel, or else it doesn't count, which is yeah, so impossible not, for everybody. He's not really engaging in that, Mr. Olson. This is a, he's describing in these psukim around um, you know, people bringing the carbon Pesach, sort of what a society or some of the contours of a society in the land of Israel are. It's not defining what a good Jew is or how much a Jew needs to be in the land of Israel, but rather what happens in a society in the land of Israel. Yeah, at Tzvi. Rabbi, doesn't the uh, Gertos mean that uh, he's observing the Shabbat Mitzvah? Yeah, it... The, so the, the, the Torah isn't clear what a Ger Toshav is, right? right? So all of that is kind of later meaning-making or halachic, various attempts to create halachic categories based on these phrases. Rav Hirsch is offering a, commentator on the, a commentary on the Chumash, which doesn't always relate or fall into neat halachic categories. Does that make sense? Right, and I think you're right, and I think what um, Stephen is saying as well, like, one could say, oh, how do we define chovot hanovaot metafkido keben enosh, the obligations that flow from a person's role as a human being? Oh, well, maybe the seven mitzvot of B'nai Noach are a good way of uh, kind of capturing that. But he doesn't say that explicitly, okay? But I hear it's a good, it's a good suggestion. Um, other comments or reactions? Here, Estelle. It's it's this is all new to me, so I'm just taking it in. I I don't have a comment uh, at the moment. Ezra. Okay. Perfect. I mean, this is all new to me too. I just to see to see this language that uses words like zichuyot rights, right? It's such modern language. Nowhere else in the Chumash do we talk about rights, right? The, it's such modern language, and I want to and I want to give one alternative aspect to the, his commentary. Is it's very easy for me nowadays to look at this and think that he's kind of imagining a Jewish state in the land of Israel. Um, hello, but but it's also it's also more it's also important to recognize that one of the things that Hirsch is contending with. One of the things that Hirsch is contending with is he's living in an emancipated Ger, 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 where Jewry is emancipated in Germany, right? Hirsch is trying to figure out what are my rights as a Jew in the modern German state? And do Jews enjoy the same rights as the Christians? Do Jews get everything that everybody else gets? Is there a sense that there's some kind of shared humanity or universal rights of man? And do the Jews get get those things too? Or are they still restricted? And in living in that kind of land, in that kind of political reality, he's starting to wonder, well, what would a Jewish state look like? Shouldn't a Jewish state have this kind of universal ideals as well in as its underpinnings and maybe even do better at it than the German state is doing? Yeah, Estelle. I was just wondering, wasn't this, this weren't these same uh, ideas voiced by Moses Mendelssohn, the whole idea, I mean, the, the whole idea of, of, of uh, equality for all, all people, including Jews, even though they, I mean, he didn't think of it as, in Israel, but just in any land or his own land. I, yes. I, I don't know. Yes, it's hard to read this, Estelle, and not think about the reformed Jewish thinkers who were using this very same language to advocate for the Jewish positions in the diaspora. And it's, to me, part of what makes it so evocative to see it here framed in the language of a theoretical Medina Yehudit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Zionism or the Zionism that we know developed in the parts of Eastern Europe where the Jews didn't have rights, they were still living in the pale. Yes. So two totally different things. 100%. And, and how they think of themselves. 100%. 100%, right? It's almost like, you know, and I read this, and I, um, like, sometimes you'll read, let's say, American, um, very American, westernized thinkers talk about what state of Israel should do. 
right? <laughs> and, you know, whatever, we could have the debate about whether they're valid on those opinions or not. And sometimes it feels like Americans are just like wanting to make Israel more like America, right? They say, no, Israel is its own place. It has its own values, its own principles, its own needs, right? Safety. And, a, and then a, a typical American would respond, no, like these are universal moral ideals, right? Like so much hubris that we all have. American exceptionalism. Yeah, and American exceptionalism or a belief that the thing that we've created is somehow better than anything else, right? <laughs> so it does feel a little bit like Hirsch is engaging in that project a little bit. He's seeing, he's part of a rapidly secularizing society in which peoples, even the not of the dominant culture, are beginning to give rights, being given rights. And he starts to say, well, maybe this is what the Torah actually believed as well. The idea that a ger toshav in the land of Israel could enjoy the same rights, even if they aren't Jewish, as long as they kind of are a decent human being. Even the Knesset have, have Arab parties. Isn't that yeah. strange? How does that, how that, how does that go with him? <laughs> and even the situation with fight with the, who say, there are Arab parties in the Knesset. Yeah. How do they go with, with the uh, Hamas people? Uh, how do you know, how do you know? How do you yeah, so I want to, I want to, I want to stay away. I want to, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to get, I want to try to focus on this text. I think these texts are very interesting and new for many of us, but yeah, it sounds like, meaning, I don't know, he's not envisioning a democratic government in the same way, right? So it's hard to know, but one could, it's not crazy to make a leap about sort of things like representation or how people are treated uh, in the land of Israel. I think this can inform that conversation or at least be brought into that conversation, Mr. Olson. So I, th I without getting into the specifics of any given party or person or Whatever, like it, he does seem to be putting forth ideas that a Jewish state is not only for Jews. Okay, right? If we go back to the first paragraph where he says, the things that occurred for the Jewish people is not just for us, but they happen for the good of all of humanity. And then if you put that with the second paragraph that says anybody who would be in a Jewish state needs to have all of those same rights it begins to open up a much more kind of like outward facing conception of what a Jewish society is there for. Um, that I don't, if you feel like I'm reading in too much, then please call me out. To me, like these words are so evocative of, of this kind of, of uh, framework. And that's not to say that he would agree with anything that's going on in Israel or disagree. It's just powerful to see his, to see his language here. It also shows in a certain way that they, even though the Hirsch and the Hirschian community separated, the outstanding from, from the rest of the Jewish community because of the issue of it was established as a basic reform community, by reading within the within the text and, and, and his interpretations of this text, in a way he's he's looking or he's finding similar assimilationist tendencies in reverse. Mm -hmm. So the concept of becoming part of the general community, even though you're separate, it pervades. It's it's the same concept that would even in the most Haredi communities in the United States, they only think they're they're American. Yeah, of course. And, yeah. and it permeates. It's not it's not as if Hirsch went and said, okay, we're going to take these German things on us. It permeated the society, and it is what you are because you live in the society. A hundred percent, right? Um, Hirsch himself, he has even these powerful essays where he kind of rips into Maimonides for um, kind of porting Ar Aristotelian philosophy into Judaism. Refer says, are you kidding me? You're bringing some external philosophical concepts and bringing them to bear on our religion? No, the religion has to flow from within, but it's impossible. We don't, we're, none of us are able to do that. There's an- Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, it's V. Robert, wasn't he himself kind of like a modernizer and a a hundred percent? Of course, of course. Yeah, it's the it's the irony of the thing, which is that right. No, he wasn't a philosopher in that sense, but you know, he, he was an innovator. Uh, you know. Yeah, I know a hundred percent. I think we all. Um, it's very easy for any of us to I, the place where you see this the most is um, on Hanukkah time, 
Okay, so in every community, there there's on Hanukkah there's people who say the Hellenizers were bringing outside ideas into Judaism, and every community has a different conception of what those outside ideas are. <laughs> right? For some, it's nationalism, and for some, it's movies and for some it's philosophy and for some it's political extremism and for some right you you go to a different Dvar Torah or a different website you go to Ish, you go to Chabad you go to YU you go to YCT you go to anything and they're gonna whatever their enemy is that's what Hellenizing is right and so there's no way to escape it but it's a thing that we do in order to kind of express our own authenticity I believe in this by the way but an easy way to try to make yourself authentic is to try to say that people who are doing other things are being influenced from the outside, right? So you see this, you see this all the time, right? The people who are angry at progressive orthodoxy say, oh, they're being influenced by leftist woke culture. And the people who are angry about certain kinds of conservatism, they say, oh, they're being influenced by the Christian right, right? Like, and we're all being influenced by everything. These ideas are in our in the in the water. Right? There's no way to escape them. The question is, what do you do with them, and how do you how do you how do you process them? So, you definitely see this in Rav Hirsch. He's using this like very politically charged language, which no other commentary before him uses, in terms of their commentary on the Chumash. And you're like, of course, he's influenced by the things that are going on around him in his in his own political milieu. Yeah. Great. Let's um let's finish this paragraph, and then let's see what's see what's going. On. So he says, Right? So Ger Toshav is what some were saying is a Ben Noach or somebody who he believes has some kind of buy-in of universal of human ideals. Uh, but the Ger Tzedek, But somebody who actually converts to Judaism is able to bring a carbon Pesach, even though his ancestors weren't um, part of the Jewish people at the time of leaving Egypt, right? This is um, yeah. Rabbi Tarfun is a descendant of converts, and he's one of the five rabbis mentioned in, in Bnei Brak, right? Yeah. And, and he's, he too has an authentic place at the Seder, even though his great-great-grandparents weren't leaving Egypt. Um, Shekane, so but look at, listen, to, listen to how he says it, right? There's different ways of imagining why somebody could bring the carbon Pesach, even if their ancestors weren't part of the Jewish people at the time of leaving Egypt. You could say, well, their souls were kind of there, or even though they weren't there, they still have the mitzvot now. Look at this amazing language. He says, Shekin gam lima'ano savlo avotayem shal Yisrael b'mitzrayim. Ba'az kiblu et cheyotam miyad Hashem. God, also for this person, yeah, for this yeah, convert, yeah. also for this person, even for this person who, whose ancestors weren't part of the Jewish people, he was suffered for as well. The Jewish people suffered for him as well, mm-hmm. or her, for them. They, they were suffered for as well in, uh, by the Jewish ancestors in the land of Israel, even though their ancestors themselves weren't Jewish. Binosaf. The carbon Pesach is not only about the past. The carbon Pesach is not just about remembering an event from the past, but it's about a continued building. That every generation we take the ideals of the carbon Pesach and they get updated and reviewed and advanced and developed. Built on the foundations of the that early event of Yitzhia um, Mitzrayim. Very powerful idea here. Um, moves away from the conversation around the Medina Yehudit, but bring, I mean, if it was, about, if it was Arab Pesach, this would be a great Dvar Torah, right? That the carbon Pesach keeps continuing on in these ideals and is why it's brought even even disconnected from the actual event that happened in the past it starts representing the values and the foundational elements of Yitzhak Mitzrayim that play out in every generation great any other comments on this first section before we see the next section no 
Okay, I know I'm, I'm giving this like a big download here. Um, so a lot of new things to take in. So let's, uh, let's see this next, let's see this next piece. So this next piece is at the um, end of the first chapter of Parshat Kedoshim. Okay, so uh, Parshat Kedoshim kind of describes the various laws of the, the land of the Jewish people, the land of Israel. This is where you have special ones like via hafta l'reacha kamocha, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. Via kibud Aim is mentioned again. Many, many mitzvot about like creating a just and civil society. Um, and, and here's his kind of uh, summary. This is Rav Hirsch's summary about the nature of paragraph, the Parsha of, of Kiddoshim, of this section. Um, the parak concludes with the holiness of a Jewish life and with two requirements. I get like, I get excited every time I read those words. Right? These are the fundamental, here are the two fundamental ideas that a Jewish state of God, a godly Jewish state is built on. Here are the foundational notions. And he says, and he says, and he contrasts this, this next paragraph in, in this next line in parentheses is wild. He says, mikol shar medinot, which is different than every other state. Mm-hmm. Purely, it's based purely on the needs, the good needs of the good of the nation whose state it is, right? So he says the Medinat Yehud, Medina Yehudit Shel Hashem is not like the other nations who build their states about their own good. Is this state, is the things good for me? The Germans build their state on what's good for Germans. The Americans build our state on what is good for an American. Okay. But he says the Medina Yehudit Shel Hashem is built on some, on two fundamental values. Ha'ikaron harishon. I mean, I, I like tear up reading this, just like reading sort of his articulation of what he believes a Jewish state is about. The fundamental values that, that drive Jewish statehood, that drive a godly Jewish state. Ha'ikaron harishon hu kavod v'avat lezulat. The dignity and love for the other. Dignity and love for the other. This is the fundamental principle of a godly Jewish state begins with the dignity and love for the other. And what's his example of this? How do we know? Sagato shal ikaronza, the example or the epitome of this fundamental value. Hiba anakat shivayon lager. Is the idea that a stranger, an alien, an immigrant living in the land of Israel gets equality. In both the rights of the state and in community. In justice. And in the feelings of love. That is the first fundamental value of a godly Jewish state. Ha'ikaron ha'sheni. The second principle, hu ha'kavod l'chok u'lemishpat, is the respect and honoring of the law and of justice. Ha'bali dei bitoi b'midot v'mishkalot kenut, which is given in the example in the Torah through having, you know, fair weights and measures in order to make sure that people create a just society. I don't know, I mean, like, I read this and, and, um, and I know he's not thinking about Jewish safety in the land of Israel, right? He, this is before all of that. He's reading the Torah and saying, 
What does God want from the Jewish people in the land of Israel? What would a godly Jewish state look like? The foundational principle is about how one person treats another. I mean, it feels so, it almost feels silly how simple it is. It almost feels like um, juvenile in, not that it's not sophisticated, but that it's just like, what does God want? What does God want a Jewish state to look like? Equality. He's also putting in the order matters because the first is Havat Mizulat, is the love of, 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 of the other. From that, you develop law and justice. Whereas, and certainly within the German concept, which is law and justice, and then, okay, we'll give you rights afterwards. So this is basically how you treat, and then you develop your laws based on that. Yeah. Yeah, we're, I mean, I don't know if the laws are based on, right? the laws are in the Torah, so I don't know if the laws are developed based on that, but it, right, in terms of the priorities, the law comes second, the first, I, I like what you're, I appreciate what you're saying a lot, the first thing is the ensuring human, is ensuring equality and dignity for every person, I mean, it's, it's a uh, mind, I find this to be like so powerful to see this articulated so clearly about what his vision is, or what his belief is about um, a Medina Yehudit Shel Hashem. Um, any comments or reactions to this one? Yes, Tihila. Am I unmuted? No, we hear you. Yes, we hear you. No, now you're muted. We heard you before, and then oh, there you go. Where did we go wrong? Look what's happened to Medina Yehudit now. There is no kavod and ahava lazulat. It's all over there. Not all. If you read the newspaper, it, it, it's it, like talking about a different Medina. Medina mm -hmm. you did. It, it, the the, the Avers was thinking of. Yeah, the fraught, the fraught nature of the of debate and of what's happening in Medina Yisrael right now and um, the discourse you read this and you read this piece from Rav Hirsch and it, it feels like it's speaking to us in this moment, right? It feels like it's saying, it's like trying to remind us, what is the fundamental basis of a Jewish state, of a godly Jewish state? Respect for and love of the other. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty powerful to read. Yes, Estelle. I, I think he's probably living in an ivory tower because <laughs> as, as we know, Jews... What is the, I mean, throughout history, we've always said that Jews always had differences of opinion. Um, he, he does, listen, he doesn't use any words here about unity, about no. everybody in agreement. He doesn't say anything like that. That is not his worldview. What is his worldview, Estelle? What are the words? Dignity Kavod. and respect, yes. But Dignity, that's respect not and in love. the nature. I mean, he's like, it's it almost feels like he's Ravavi. He's a loving our fellow Jew. But like, he's it's amazing. A, he, he's not living in the world. He's living in his ivory tower. Well, so he first of all, he he wasn't he was a he was a community rabbi and he he did deal with lots of people and he had profound disagreements with other Jews and with the broader Jewish community, right? So he certainly was not one to um, shy away from disagreement. But I agree, Estelle, that I agree that this is a theoretical values statement. This is not like a, this is not like teaching us how to resolve conflicts. This is not telling us what to do in this moment. But he's articulating that from Parshat Kedoshim, the basis of a godly Jewish state has to be about equality and honor and dignity and love for the other. Um, and I don't know if that has to be like, uh, I don't think he needs to articulate what pragmatically that might look like. Although, you know, the Parsha Kedoshim tells us all these kinds of things that we have to do in order to, to have that. Um, but the idea that that's the fundamental value that's driving a godly Jewish state, I think, is a powerful is a powerful statement even on its own. You know what? What's interesting though, you think within a family, 
a family you have dignity and love for each other, which is the ideal family. But it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. And, and what would be if everybody had dignity and love for each other, where would be the conflict? Where would be the progression? Where would be the idea of wanting to, to progress and do new and wonderful things? You don't think that you can have dignity and love for the other and also progress? Well, sometimes conflict breeds progression. Yeah, but I, I don't think, he's not saying that there's not a lot to be conflict, Estelle. He's not saying that conflict is off limits. He's saying what is dry, what are the driving forces or the driving conflict? Forces? Conflict oh, is oh, one oh, of oh, the oh, main oh, driving oh, forces. Okay, wait, so you like think if everybody if everybody was sitting back, was sitting back and saying, This is all wonderful, where would we want he to didn't, go? I don't further? think Estelle, I don't think he's saying any of that. He didn't say everything is wonderful. He didn't say, right, say this something? is not a kumbaya message something? at all. What? Rabbi Ezra, Rabbi Ezra, I want to add something. Okay? Yes. I add something. Yes. Listen, before the Indian be response, the Bob Ben Israel, who loves his people, Israel. That's his people. What about the rest? He didn't say about the rest of the people. Bless God, you Hashem, who loves his people, Israel. That's his people. Yeah, what and about the he, rest of the people? The other people, right? Yeah, so he, he's saying right? that there's lots of people Israel. That's all his people. Israel's his people. The rest of the world, yeah. I doesn't know about the rest of the world. Yeah, and he's saying huh? you're right, and he's saying that a Jewish state, a godly Jewish state, what our first is saying, has to look even beyond that in terms of how it treats every all of its inhabitants. Um yeah. What, what, what does Hashem say? I love, I love my people, Israel. The rest of the people, of we call me, all the other people. I, I told you, uh, all, 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 let's read. Let's read. Let's read one. one, one uh, let's read one more paragraph, and then we will. Yeah, it's. I, uh, it's there's, there's like, there's various values. God's love for the Jewish people, or choosing the Jewish people, can be separate. Can be a different idea than when the Jewish people have a medina. What are their responsibilities? Mm -hmm. Okay, and I want to. I want to look at. This, I, I want to ask another question. Was there anybody outside the Jewish people who left? Who left uh, in, uh, in Exodus? Was there anybody else before, besides the Jewish people? Were there any converts? Or who was there besides the Jewish people that, that left? The Jewish people, when they came to the land of Israel, they did not succeed in destroying all the nations that were there. And they wound up living side by side with all kinds of other people. But 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 he wasn't. He didn't, I don't think he wanted them to live with other people. Because if you they talk about the Shira, well, you got to destroy all these all the all the all the, all the, all the idols. They didn't. They didn't. They didn't do that. Wasn't he supposed, um, to, wasn't he supposed to do that? They were supposed to do wasn't that. Yes. Supposed, weren't you supposed to do that? Yeah, that was part of the initial commandment of conquest. Yes. Conquest, that's the word. Conquest. Yes. Okay, I want to read one more. I want to read one more paragraph and then we'll then we'll wrap up. So he says, This is in the end of Parshat Mishpatim after the civil laws have been described. He says, Hamivchan Hamiti shall ekronot ela ye open bo hamidina ha yudit mityacheset el hazarim. The big question, yeah. the fundamental test of Jewish values is how we relate to the outsiders, to the foreigners. Hazarim tzrichim lehanot mikol hazichiyot hamuanakot lezrachim. The outsiders, the immigrants, the, the strangers need to benefit from all of the rights that are given to the citizens. V'yesh linhog imam biava and we have to act with them with love and kindness. The way in which a country relates to its others, its strangers, its foreigners within its boundaries. Is directly uh, measuring stick 
for what is the righteousness and humanity that operates within that Medina, right? He says the way we treat immigrants in our community, in our nation, whether it's in Germany or in America or in Israel, the way we treat Zarim, the other, mm-hmm. is the ultimate measuring stick of what is a country's uh, basic humanity and sense of righteousness and justice. Um, and I want, I want to read one more. I want to read one more line here. He said, "Shekane dinim ela." These laws of Parsha Mishpatim noadim lahavi belev b'nei ha'am are there to bring into the hearts of the Jewish people and to the children of the nation that live in the land of Israel et hakara. The recognition, shagam him tzrichim lirot atzmam lechol hayoter, that they need to see themselves as much as anyone kizarim, the gairim, the eretz Hashem, the al admat Hashem. The Jewish people themselves have to see themselves as strangers and converts in the land, in God's land, in the land of God on God's earth. <laughs> Um, and so what's so powerful here is um, to see Rav Hirsch's focus on what he envisions as a godly Jewish state is about like equality and about how we treat one another. It's, it's, I don't know. I feel very moved by that. I feel very surprised by that to see this language in somebody writing in the 1860s, 1870s about a future Jewish state. And it's not about Jewish safety or what's best for the Jews, but it's about that the Jews who run this, who are part of the state need to see themselves as strangers, need to see themselves as resident aliens in God's land. And that their thing they need to do is ensure the dignity of themselves and their neighbors. Um, it's a power. It's well, a power. The, the Arbor, the Arbor, how do the other people treat the Jews? Where you live? How do the other people treat the Jews? That's why at least anyway. Look at the Arbors. Do the Jews have to treat the people like that? What, what, what does the how do people they treat the Jews? Yeah, a hundred percent. Meaning, I a hundred percent agree, Stuart. I think he's saying that like this is what God's vision for the world is. God's vision for the world. And that is conveyed through these mitzvot and these various commandments and the ideals of what a Medina Yehudit could look like is one about equality and treating people with dignity. Um, and it, acting, it, it, but, but in those days, they were, Jews were, were treated so well. The other, the, and these the, days, right? too, yeah. Jews aren't treated so well in other places, of course. And just be, and but, and the point is that a godly state isn't like every other state, right? A godly state is one that inspires us and requires us to care for the other, to that's have not equality all... as the basis of the Medina. But not all God-fearing people feel the same way. I'm just, this is Rav Hirsch. I'm My goal here today was to share with you True. Rav Hirsch's viewpoint. Of course, there are many, many other viewpoints. Um, I think that goes without saying. Uh, there are many viewpoints about what the nature or the needs of a Jewish state are. Um, and it could be that Rav Hirsch is wrong or Rav Hirsch is living in an ivory tower or that Rav Hirsch is thinking idealistically but has no idea how politics actually work or how survival actually works, right? We can, we can offer many, many critiques of Rav Hirsch's position here, Estelle and others, 100%. But I, I, I hate to offer a critique. I wish it was so. But I, I and I think that even in a world of critiques and val and incredibly valid v- critiques, the articulation of these values and what he says are the principles, not just like values or like bonuses or asides, right? I can I can imagine a person saying like, yeah, a Jewish state, like the primary purpose is the safety of the Jewish people. The secondary purpose is um you know the development of jewish culture the tertiary purpose is being startup nation yeah. a light unto nations 
the fourth purpose is to make sure that you know we model equality right you could and that might be reflective of other some of the people in the on this call's view that sometimes that's reflective of my view and what Hirsch says it says no the the priority you know what's at the core you know what's at the core of this project the core of this project is about seeing the un universal humanity of the other and about creating a system and a society where people can live with dignity and respect. And I don't know, to me, that's like, a, it's very, it's very powerful to see. Yeah, Tzvi. Right, so why then is it not better known? You know, there, there are things that, you know, it amazes me how, you know, I read things that you would think would, would be you know, much more out there, and it, it just seems to be obscure. And Rav Hirsch is, you know, uh, not a lightweight, you know, I mean, he <laughs> is a very prominent Rav, you know, he was a Gadol. I mean, for that matter, I will tell you this also, what's, you know, as long as we're on this topic, uh, what's also not well known is that the Nitzib was a Zionist. I, I'm just, yeah, kidding, right, I mean, Bar Bari, Bari Lan is, uh, is named after mm -hmm. the family, yeah. Son, his son, Rav Meir Barilan, they, but that's known that Rav Meir Barilan was a, was a very ardent Zionist. It's not known that then it was a Zionist. I'm just saying it. Yeah, a, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I think it, I think it's a good question. I would say I, I think we have to go back to some of the, my early caveats, which is that Rav Hirsch was not a Zionist, and he was not even part of any kind of proto-Zionist community right no he but, but, he, but this he's not in here though about about you know the way you know what the purpose of a jewish country is i i, I understand that he wasn't a zionist yeah but. so i mean i think this is a beautiful text it's it's very, very easy to read these texts and think to yourself well you know he was really kind of just imagining a better version of germany <laughs> Right, Germany, you know Germany. That was going through its hands. One that. second, Mr. That. Olson. I want to finish the sentence. So, like that, he's just imagining a better version of Germany, or he's so influenced by kind of Western secularized mm -hmm. ideals, um, uh, right? Like French Revolution ideas, American, right? These are kind of em emancipatory ideas about how people and various religions are supposed to be treated, and so like. That's just being projected onto the Torah and onto our world. Like I, I think that could be a, val a potential critique of this. I think also because he's not in the, he's not in the discourse of, he's not in Zionist discourse, right? He wasn't part of that kind of conversation, or he he was, but he took a very oppositional approach. So it's not crazy to think that these ideas, which are kind of buried in various comments throughout the Chumash. Uh, wouldn't be seen as an important kind of basis for any of the Zionist thought that comes after it. For me, I think it's very interesting to come across this and to be exposed to what he was kind of imagining, which it sounds, it's pretty beautiful what he's imagining. It's very powerful. Hey, Rabbi, but Rabbi, when I'm, I, I get that he wasn't, real, real. I, but when I'm asking you, why is, are these ideas not, you know, um more prominently discussed that's what i'm saying even though he wasn't yeah. as well i guess i guess here we are discussing them today and Svi, you can discuss them with you with your Khevra, and okay. uh, we'll spread we'll spread the torah okay thank you <laughs> uh joni yeah. okay um how do i get rid of the hand all right uh so, do you hear me yeah we hear you okay so two things um rav hirsch's um you know, thinking is based upon uh, the other, the stranger is going to, um, you know, be, behave themselves, yeah. act according to the rules of the land. So, um, you know, he, he doesn't sort of imagine what if that doesn't happen, Correct. right? What if they actually are, you know, mistreating the Jewish people? So that's one thing. The other thing is that, it's interesting to me because so much of the Torah in terms of going into the land, just in last week's parsha, killing all the men uh, and taking the women and the booty. And, you know, why isn't Rav Hirsch drawing on, on that ideology, which is so prevalent? Yeah. Why isn't that in influencing him? 
Yeah, I think that's, um, you know, Mr. Olson was kind of getting at that before as well. So I, I agree. I, I think they're both really good points. The first is, in, in when it comes to imagining this play out, he's very clear that if a person who's living in your land doesn't kind of share the values of, of basic human decency, uh, mm-hmm. that they don't enjoy the, the same rights. So I think it's a really... I'm grateful, Joni, for you uh, bringing that up as well, right? It's not like, but which to me, you could read it as a severe limiting of his worldview or just saying, or a um, an important caveat that says like, don't do this to a fault to the extent where yeah. it spells your own demise, right? Of course, you have to be aware of who you're giving rights to and what how they're going to act and what they're going to do with those rights. The second thing, your second point, is I would I like to make an, an important distinction between the conquest of the land of Israel and then what a Jewish society or what a godly society that's being set up looks like. And one of the things that the Chumash is very clear about is that or the God is so um, unsatisfied or unhappy with the culture of the land of Israel before the Jewish people get there, that that culture has to be eradicated, you know, both the worshiping of Odazara and various other ills and mistreatment of one another, that that culture has to be eradicated before you can come in and build this more, you know, utopian society, okay? And um, that seems to be the kind of the angle or the thrust of the Torah. We're not going to write... Most of the utopias, we could talk about whether they succeeded or not, right? There was a big utopian movement in the 19th century in America, mm-hmm. right? They didn't, they didn't build those utopias in the middle of Manhattan, right? They went off and found a commune in the middle of Gehaktivindaville, and they tried their best, right? And so there was a real sense that if the Jewish people want to build this godly society, that they actually have to clear the land out in order to be able to do so. And, and the way to, the Torah prescribes to do that is by incredibly violent means. It doesn't seem to imagine that the people who already inhabit the land are going to mm-hmm. kind of just, be, you know, very easily hand it over and say, sure, we'll adapt to your principles and, and value sets. So I, I think it's, um, it's a fair critique. And, it, and I think it's one that manifests itself often in today's age, right? If you look at the commandments of what we're supposed to do when we arrive in that initial moment, right? It's incredibly violent and it's incredibly conflict-based and it's incredibly about conquest. And the question is, okay, I can open the Torah and there's hundreds of chapters that describe different commandments and different values. Which ones do I choose to focus on when it comes to what my Judaism looks like today? And I think if as the Jewish people in moments where we're feeling incredibly insecure and incredibly threatened about our place in society, then it's, it's very reasonable to try to turn towards the commandments of conquest, the commandments of taking power and looking at those as models for us. But I think then on the other hand, in moments where we maybe feel more security or feel that we have a certain ability to establish a, a way of living, um, that we turn to what Rav Hirsch is pointing out is what he believes are the fundamental virtues and values that should be driving a godly Jewish state. Uh, so I think your point is very well taken. Um, and, and I think Rav Hirsch is saying that is all could be true. And nonetheless, these are what, we, what I view based on Parsha Mitzvatim and Parsha Kedoshim. And the laws of, he has more about the laws of Shemitah and the laws of Shabbos and all of these things, which he says are there to help us learn that we too are strangers, we too must respect the other, and that that equality of humanity is the foundational principle uh, for a Medina Yehudi uh, Elohit. Um, and I, I think that's a very uh, profound notion that he's putting forward. Uh, any other final? Well, I, I think all those things are all these things about Shemitah is all related to Jews and Jews. That's what it is. Only between the people themselves. Those, those are the people that, that settled the land. Those the, the Shemitah and all those things were Jewish people. I don't think it's for the, for the other people. So I don't think you're right. I don't think you're right. That's I to me. I read the thrust of this 
of these pieces that I've collected here, and it he takes it does appear to have a much more universal is. approach. He's, Mr. He's, Olson. Like, he's talking about people who read the Torah. People who read the Torah are the ones that follow those rules. Uh, the other people don't read the Torah. Okay, I want to. I want to. They don't practice those. Rules. I don't know how else I can prove I it to you other than reading more. But <laughs> here. Mm. I don't understand that. I'm going to show you. Follow the rules. I'm going to show you. Shmira al dinim et ha'am, guarding these laws drives the nation. Lohokir ba'ofen ra'oi ve'gavoa yoter et kol ha'arachim ha'musariim ve'haruchaniim, that elevates the values, the spiritual and moral values. Et ha'adam ha'enoshi, the human being. The Shehima Yisod Lishivayon, and this is the principle, this is the foundation of the equality. Kol B'nai Ha'adam, with all people. It does not say, he does not say with Yehudim. It says, Kol B'nai Ha'adam, Bifnei Ha'chok, in front of the law. Ula Ha'ava Hadadit Ben Adam Lachavero, and the foundational principle for love that is engendered between a man and his friend. Mm-hmm. Okay, all of these push this view. Um, I, w- I was, can I say, I want to say one thing. I was nine years old when Eretz Yisrael was formed. Uh, and the first day that Israel was formed, they were attacked by the Arab League. All the people were against us. We, we, we didn't, when, when the people came there, all the people attacked us. All the other people attacked us. Don't, 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 that, 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 is that what Rabbi Hirsch thought would be? Is that what he thought would be? We, the first first, day, the first hour, we attacked. Right Mr. Olson, Mr. Olson, Mr. Olson, I, I, it's not. It's very, and I know we've 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 had this conversation before in this in this group, and I, uh, and I understand. <laughs> I understand. Uh, I'm, I'm not you naive. Really, I, Mr. Olson, can I, I would like to, I would love to finish a sentence. I am not naive about the realities of what it is to be a Jew today, what it is to be um, a Jew founding the state of Israel and the threats and the existential crisis that um, occurs as Jews try to establish their own state. I am not blind to that at all. That drives us to understand what we need to do to protect ourselves. What Rav Hirsch is saying, don't, he's saying don't confuse that thing with what a godly Jewish society can look like. Mm-hmm. Don't confuse that threat, that, that existential threat, the fact that we have en- enemies. Don't, of course, defend yourself. Don't confuse defending and protecting yourself with what is the society and the world that we're trying to build and live in. Yes, if you think that that existential crisis is the only thing that is, exists in this world, then we will be in a survival defensive mentality forever. And some of us might choose to live that way. But Rav Hirsch is saying, saying, I read the Torah, I see what God wants of a Jewish society, of a Jewish people, of a land of Israel that belongs to God. And it's more than that. It's more than just defense or protection or survival. It's about building a society that models and invests in the dignity and respect of other and that creates a society that is equal for all. Not Midinat Yisrael as startup nation, we have, or we have the most Nobel prizes or you know, or that we have uh, the greatest high tech startups, or that we have the best kibbutz uh, watering land, and all those things can be true, and those things are beautiful and inspiring and important. But what does a Jewish godly state look like, according to Rav Hirsch? One that ensures the dignity and the humanity of all its inhabitants, and that this is what God is looking to build for the world. Okay, that's what Refer says. I think it's a great place uh, to stop. And I'm very, very grateful for our learning together today and for all Thank days you. Oh, yeah. uh, over these years. And um, yeah. I still hope to be able to I'm, find I'm, more time to connect with I you next week. And um, thank you so much. All right.
Thank you. Thank you, Ezra. It was very.